Hello, everyone. You are listening to YourRadio.com with DJ Sakara, and we are back with you this weekend again for another community interview. And today we have the pleasure of receiving the Guardians of Light from Pacific. Um, and to get to know this guild a little better, we have uh, their guildmaster, Manny, and um, two of his council members, Iron Claw and Solid Snake. I will give them each a chance to um, introduce themselves so you guys can uh, get familiar with their voices. And uh, But before I do that, I want to remind everyone that if you want to ask any questions to our guests, you can do so via our um, IRC channel. You have all the details for that on um, our website, www.uoradio.com. And uh, you can also send uh, your questions via ICQ if you so wish. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce you our um, our guest. So Manny, if you want to take a second and say uh, hi to everybody. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Manny, GM of GOL. And uh, Iron Claw, if you want to say hello. Hello, everyone. My name's Iron Claw. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, our last but not least guest, Solid Snake, if you want to say hi. Hey there, you Radio. Nice to meet you. Guardian Commander of GOL. And so, we're going to go right into the thick of things. And um, I guess the first question will be addressed to Manny, um, but every any other question I ask will be ad- addressed to um, to any of the three of you. And so, as you know, if you want to answer, just go ahead with the channel commander. So, um, Manny, are you the founder of uh, the Guardians of Light? And uh, if yes, what inspired you to um, begin this guild? Uh, I am not. I am the fifth GM in a long succession of GMs since 1998. And what was the, the foundation of, uh, of this guild? And also, how did you end up being the GM of that guild? Um, well, it was formed from an old guild called the Black Arrow uh, back in 98. It was uh, actually called the Cesarian Freedom Guild back then. And um, not too long after they formed, uh, April of 98, the refugees then formed, no, actually in February of 99, the Guardians of Light was uh, renamed. So, um that was uh, under the leadership of Zena, who was the GM for about four years. Um, I became a member in 2002 and um, just uh, rose through the ranks steadily. Um, when UO started the uh, new emissary ability on Guildstones, I was uh, GOL's first emissary. And um, let's see, when Cyber Dragon, there was a GM before me, step down, I was uh, the next logical choice. That's interesting. Um, I, it just, I guess, I'm not really used to um, GMs uh, stepping down. I've seen it more, I guess, with RP guilds um, than with, um, I guess, not RP guilds. But then again, I guess I'm kind of getting a bit ahead of myself here. What type of guild are you guys exactly? Um, Because I know that from reading your website, I kind of had mixed feeling about it. Um, In a way, you seem to be RP guild, but at the same time, you seem to be more of a hunting guild. So how would you actually classify... Oh, my God, I can't speak anymore. How would you actually classify yourself? Pretty much as a family. Um, we're just a large group of players uh, from across the spectrum. We have some that never leave Faluka. We have others that wouldn't dream of going there and never insure their stuff. Um, but uh, really, we just uh, all treat each other like family and help each other out when we can. And all follow the virtues. No red players. Wow. Um Actually, I think that's fairly impressive. So you guys actually go out with uninsured stuff hunting together? Uh, In Trammel, yes. Um, If the guild is going on a champ spawn, we have uh, commanders and guardians like Solid Snake here that will make sure that people are insured and they're not going to lose their stuff to a PK guild. 
I was wondering about that if you actually went to uh, to fell out at all. So you do do champ spawns. Um, it's interesting though that you would say no reds. Why not? Um, just always been a policy, and it's always been a good one. And and uh, yeah, I've just never seen any reason to change it. Hmm. Interesting. And so, what are your recruiting policies? If somebody wants to join your guild, um, how would they go about it? Um, I think I'm going to defer that one over to Ironclaw. Um, he is also in a group called the Recruiting Committee and probably best uh, able to answer this question. Okay, go ahead, Ironclaw. Yeah, uh, well, if anybody wants to join our guild, the first thing we do is uh, we'd like to talk to them a little bit in-game so we get an idea of um, you know, what kind of personality we're dealing with. And then we do direct them directly to our website. If it's all right, I'll go ahead and give that out. It's uh, gol.guildportal.com. And from there, anybody who's interested in joining our guild can fill out an application. Now, the, we really don't have any particular requirements aside from what Manny pointed out. We don't have any red players in the guild, and we'd like to keep it that way. We have players that range from previous experience with the game as high as six years or more, all the way up to a couple applications we received a couple weeks ago. Uh, it was their second day in the game. So you don't have to have a particular experience level with the game or a particular skill set. We're open to everybody. Um, like Manny pointed out, we have players that do everything. Uh, we have uh, groups, you know, specialty groups, if you will, that uh, do champ spawns, we have crafters, we have people that do nothing but PVM, uh, we have a group of people that like to train up in PVP and help us out as needed. So it, it, there really is no requirement to join our guild um, aside from um, more of the technical side, like you have to have, um, I think the, the, last, the last expansion, which was ML, you have to have that in a couple of the communication applications. But other than that, uh, there is no requirement except a good-natured person with uh, good intentions. And it looks like Manny needs to chime in there. Uh, yeah, I was just um, going to... Go ahead. I was just going to say that we do have several reformed uh, murderers and uh, members of Red PK guilds. Um, it's just they, they have to kind of put that behind them and play on their blues. I see. Um, there is one thing, oh my god, I'm actually kind of forgetting here. I'm getting a blank. Something that you mentioned, oh yes, uh, something that Ironclaw mentioned. Um, I'm assuming when you're talking about applications, you're talking about um, things such as um, TeamSpeak or, or um, how's the other one called, Ventrilo or something like that. Um, is that what you're referring to? Go ahead, Ironclaw. Um, actually, the applications that we use, um, we do use TeamSpeak primarily. Um, it came in uh, about a year ago, I guess. We started using it real heavily. And then our primary form of communication was ICQ. We still require all applicants have ICQ. Uh, TeamSpeak is also a requirement. It's very effective when we're doing hunts and any like peerless hunts, champ spawns, things like that. Uh, Snake is actually our host for the TeamSpeak server, and he's uh, real educated on that. So if you have any technical questions, I would say talk to Solid Snake on that. Um, he brought that to the to, get to the guild and set it up for us, and he's been real good at keeping it up. Um, he also maintains our uh, auto map server, so we can use that in case people get lost or you know jumbled and stuff like that. We can find each other rather well. Other than that, uh, we used to use Merck. And that was our primary form of communication, and we phased that out more or less. Um, there hasn't been any use for it in a very long time. Um, we're able to communicate very well with the mediums that we're using now. And since UO instituted the guild chat, there's really no need for anything aside from you know the uh, guild chat, ICQ, and TeamSpeak. Yeah, I have to agree with that. I think that whole guild chat thing is just a bomb. Um, there was one thing, though, that you mentioned that kind of made me raise my eyebrow on that one, um, and it was regarding um, expansions. Is it actually a requirement that they have the latest expansion 
um, in order to remain in your guild or or to join your guild? Go ahead, Iron Claw. Um, well, it would definitely help that they have at least an expansion that has Samurai Empire. Uh, we did move our guild house uh, several months ago, maybe about two, three months ago, to the Takuna Islands. It's located just east of the Zento Moon Gate, so it's less than one screen east from there. And in order to get there, you have to have the expansion. So yes, I would say that they have to have Samurai Empire or higher. Now we do um, periodically go out uh, several times a day to do peerless hunts, and those are usually led by Solid Snake. And you know you can't go into the dungeons or the new dungeons without ML, but that isn't a requirement. We do require Samurai Empire and higher, though. Okay. So what would happen? Let's say the next expansion comes in, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here. But let's say the next expansion comes in and it introduces new lands. For sure, it's going to probably introduce some form of area that you can only access through, um, you know, that expansion. And you have somebody that's been in the guild for however long, and for whatever reason, they decide not to acquire it, uh, whether they can't afford it or they just really don't want it. Um, would that affect their membership? Go ahead, Iron Claw. I would say no, not at all. Um, we did have several people that were still using uh, AOS because they hadn't been in the game for a long time. And they eventually, I think UO Gold came out, something along those lines. And it was in the uh, bargain bin at several stores and they went and picked it up and they were able to access all the areas that we needed them to. But right now, where our tavern is, that location can't be beat. I honestly do not see us changing locations for some time. Uh, one screen away from a moon gate and access to a full city. You can't pass that up. Absolutely. I fully agree on that one. Um, the next question I would have for you guys is, do you have any alliances currently or are you basically standing alone? And by alliances, I mean not only not necessarily just are you green to some other guild, but do you have any form of ties or bonds to any other guild on your shard where where you have some kind of a special relationship going on there? Yes, Solid Snake. Officially, we're not allied with anybody, but for the most part, we're in good standings with EOF and some other good virtuous guilds and such. Um, we usually do... Uh, we join in their events that they host, and if we host any special event, we'll uh, invite them. Okay. Um, the reason I'm kind of—I was kind of asking that—is because I, you know, I'm, I always can't help but wonder what is the benefit of being part of an alliance um, when you're in mostly a tribal-based guild. Um, you know, whereas it's a lot more obvious if you're if you play in, in Faluka. Um, but now, the, I guess the question I would have for you is regarding champ spawns. Do you guys actually um, do harrowers and such, or do you pretty much leave it to uh, you know? Do you pretty much limit yourselves to doing champ spawns from time to time? Yes, solid snake. We uh, really haven't done any harrowers. Uh, getting the uh, the Fairy guys, uh, skull is kind of difficult, so we usually limit ourselves to the quick and easy spawns to complete, like the rat spawn and uh, dragon spawn, so we can get in, get out without putting our guild at risk from any other guilds raiding us. But for the most part, we just stick with those chance spawns. And what about um, defending your spawns? I know, um, I believe it was both Ironclaw and Manny kind of mentioned that. Um, you guys, you have some of your members that are more focused on uh, the PvP side of things. Um, do you feel like you have sufficient numbers PvP-wise to, you know, actually put up a good fight, or is it something you would even want to do? Um, and is your the other guilds that you're kind of well semi-allied to, would they actually come? help the family with one of your spawns should you get heavily raided. Yes, Solid Snake. 
Well, um, the group that is dedicated for the PvP tactics is called the Guardians. The Guardians are basically there to protect the rest of the guild that aren't more PvP inclined. Should we get raided, the Guardians are there to make sure that they distract the enemy long enough to, uh, to either get rid of them, but if we can't get rid of them, we distract them long enough to get the rest of the guild members out of Felucca, and then we try and regain control of the chance spawn, but the Guardians are a fairly decent sized group, but against a whole guild, it's quite difficult at times. We've had we have reclaimed some chance spawns, but if we are outnumbered, we know not to just stay around and just die for no reason. As for other guilds that come in to assist, um, we don't have we don't really ask that many guilds to come in and help us. We did have a few guilds um, that we weren't officially allied with, but were in good standing. Uh, we have called upon their help, and they have assisted us, like ESF. And, um, you know, I can help but wonder, um, when you were mentioning this, um, EFL is back to in on Pacific. Has that um, actually made a huge difference for you, champ spawn-wise? Because, um, you know, they had been on tour for almost a year now. Um, and I've seen that they've come back in numbers on Pacific, so I'm kind of curious about that, how the dynamics of Faluka have been affected on your shards since uh, their return. Go ahead, Solid Snake. They have definitely made things a lot more interesting. It is, by no doubt, a lot harder to complete a chance spawn with them running around. Um, but we still give it a shot, you know. We're not going to let them run us out of fail completely. Uh, we'll give it a shot, and if they raid us, we try and push them back. And if we can't handle them, we just get on out of there. But for sure, they made things a lot harder. But we're not going out without a fight. That's definitely the spirit. Um, so basically, do you guys role play at all? Or is that really not um, part of uh, your uh, regular activities? The reason I'm asking really is because I, when I was reading your rules of conduct and such, um, they were really written in, well, not in old English, but some of them, um, you know, were, uh, well, especially like each of the titles, like, you know, Thou shalt, shalt Not Steal and so on and so forth. Um, I thought it was interesting, so I was kind of wondering uh, how much role play plays a part in in uh, your guild. Go ahead, Manny. Um, it, it's come and gone over the years. Uh, we've had uh, groups of elves and uh, orcs that were very serious into the role play and would hardly ever break character. And um, it, it brought a lot of flavor to the game for them, and we kind of encouraged that. But at the same time, it's, it's a lot of pressure for a lot of people to always be in a character. Um, but definitely the standard greeting uh, when you meet your mates at the tavern is hail. Um, so... Uh, it, I'd say role play light at these days. Alrighty, and event wise, um, I know you guys do a lot of uh, hunting and this and that. But do you have like any guild specific events that you actually organize, or community events that you organize, or if there is like any recurring event? Like some certain guilds will have like I don't know, like LLTS that we had last. Um, was it last week, two weeks ago? Um, they, you know, they organize the um, the weekly um, crafters day or an event of uh, some sort re uh, related to crafting. Do you guys have something like that? Go ahead, Iron Claw. Oh well, we definitely have something like that. Um, actually, um, first off, we do have a monthly event. We call it our G O L Mall Repair Night. And that is located at our mall, and that's also located east of Zento. Now it's one screen east of our guildhouse. Once again, another reason why we wouldn't move uh, two great locations. But um, there, uh, everyone on the shard is welcome to, to come by. They can get their items repaired for free. There's no charge. Um, it's a nice community event. It usually goes for at least an hour, sometimes two. Um, it's a nice recruiting tool. There's a lot of people that show up. It's a good turnout from our guild, and there's plenty of vendors to choose from. And throughout the actual week and months, we have um, events that go every single day just about. Uh, we average about five events planned for the guild a week. 
Uh, that includes our meeting. We have a, um, a guardian-related event that happens er, uh, once a week. We have a squire-related event that happens once a week. And for members of the guild that aren't in either section, uh, you know, they don't qualify as a squire or a guardian, we have the order hunt. And what that is, it's a random place, random location, and we just go out and we hunt. <laughs> sometimes it's resource gathering, sometimes it's a, a game, scavenger hunt, things like that. We definitely mix it up with um, all of our members, so it, it, there's always something going on. And even things that aren't listed on the calendar, we, go, like I said earlier, we go out for peerless hunts all the time. So it's definitely an activity-related guild. Awesome. I believe Vice Roy wants to ask a question or make a comment. Go ahead, Vice. Yes, uh, I have a question about events, you know, since we're on the topic of, it, of doing events and stuff like that. I'm kind of curious, though, you know, being a guild of your size and everything on the Pacific and everything, uh, do you guys by any chance do anything like what LL, uh, TS on Atlantic does, uh, where they have any, like, real-life gatherings or where they get together once a year or something like that? And uh, if so, can you tell me a little bit about it? Uh, go ahead, Solid Snake. Uh, just a few months ago, we had a uh, real-life uh, gathering uh, over in Washington, in Tacoma. And we just pretty much gathered around, um, had a good old time, uh, pretty much talked about UO, went to a medieval fair and such. And I'd say the most interesting part of the experience is we didn't really refer to each other in our real-life names. We just kept calling each other by our Ultima Online names. Okay, so in other words, you know, you, you go up to someone like me and you might call me just Viceroy rather than calling me by my real, not, uh, real life name, right? Exactly. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and so y'all do this once a year, and, uh, we're, you know, and uh, can you maybe tell me about a little bit more about the last one? Uh, how many people was there? Uh, you know, uh, what, what kind of activities you guys do when y'all do get together or what? You know, uh, tell me a little bit more about the details. Go ahead, Iron Claw. Uh, well, actually, I just wanted to comment. Uh, I'll let Snake follow up right after this because he was actually there, and Manny was too. But I just wanted to point out that uh, just because we all play on the Pacific Shard doesn't mean we're all located in that area of the country. I, myself, I'm in the Midwest. I'm in Ohio. Uh, we have members that are in Japan, Australia, England, and a few other places if we actually pinned them down and got an answer. And a lot of Canadians, and shout out to Canada. But it's just funny that um, the people, the core group of the guild itself, are able to um, make the trek to a particular location and get together and have a really great time. And while I wasn't there, yeah, you know, I was kind of there in spirit, and I'm sure they had a great time. And it sounded like it was a blast, and they took pictures and everything like that. So it's a really diverse group. But like I said, a snake can fill you in all the details because he was actually there. All right, uh, go ahead, snake. Uh, fill us in. <laughs> all right. Well, pretty much. Uh we, um, when the first day, you know, everyone was doing all the traveling, so we pretty much relaxed and such, and uh, played a few video games here and there. And like I said earlier, we went to a uh, medieval rent fair and uh, it was a blast. Um, we got some fake weapons that we bought there, and we did a, uh, a PvP tournament there, and, uh, you know, had people with uh, dual swords, big humongous swords. We actually had a guy with a fake hammer, and we were doing all sorts of fighting uh, things, just having a good old time. Um, we also went out to other places, uh, restaurants and such, and hung out, got to know each other better and such. And uh, I'd say roughly about uh, 15 to 20 people showed up for this event. And we had people come from all over. I myself live in Mississippi and took the trek all the way up to Washington myself. Okay, so this event was in uh, Washington State. Um, where, where at was he in uh, Washington State? Was he in like Seattle, Washington, or, or what? It was in Tacoma. Okay, and uh, about these little, you know, get-togethers and everything, um, I mean, you, you say y'all play games. Can you tell me, like, what kind of games y'all play uh, other than this, uh, you know, running around with fake swords and everything? Well, um, for console games, we're just playing a lot of uh, first-person shooter and fighter fighting games and such. Um, we played a little bit of UO while we were there. We linked up some computers and such, but we didn't do too much of that. Um, but for the most part, we just hung out and, you know, chit-chat and had a good time. Okay, and what, what is the, um, you say you had people come from all over. What, who was the person that came from the farthest distance 
you know, to the location, uh, you, you all mentioned that you all have players in Japan, uh, Japan and Australia uh, and uh, Canadians and stuff. So who made the furthest trip and where were they from? Uh, can you tell me about that? I believe I was the one who made the furthest trip. I was in Mississippi, uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi, and I took a three-day bus trip up there. And I'll never do that again. Um, on the trip back, I took a plane, thankfully. But, yeah, I believe I was the one that made the furthest trip. All right. Uh, and, yes, I, I got another question about uh, about y'all's guild. I'm looking over here on the website. I'm not sure how reliable this website is and everything on the UO.com. On, on this uh, top 20 guilds or whatever it is, it's showing 240 veteran members, yet when you actually click on the link and everything, it's showing uh, 50, 18 veteran members and 50, and 50 members. Um, can you guys give me a more of a ballpark figure as to how many people do you guys have in your guild, or or how many people actually make up your guild, or is it just a bunch of accounts, you know, that you guys have in there, you know, like some of these other larger guilds where they just put all their accounts and characters in? Because, you know, LLTS uh, on Atlantic, they pretty much require that all your accounts be in their guild. Uh, so I'm kind of curious whether or not you guys have a similar policy or are these actual individual characters or or players, you know? Um, so, do you any of you guys can answer that question possibly, maybe? I guess you guys are trying to figure that one out. Uh, go ahead, Manny. I guess I'll let you answer that one. Um, actually, a lot of our members that are squires uh, are only allowed one character on the stone until they go through a, about a two-month process to actually become full members. Um, once they become full members, they can have as many characters as they have accounts on the stone. But until we've made sure that they're GOL material, it's just one piece. Makes it a lot easier to boot them. Okay, and uh, about this number, 250 or so, so, which one's more right, 250 or this 50, uh, Manny? Um, as far as vet members, uh, or vet um, characters on the stone, 250. Um, the website actually gives us a more accurate uh, uh, idea of how many active members we have. There's about 90 members that are active on the website, and probably around 60 of those have logged in within the last couple of days. So um, fairly strong numbers for a guild, I think. Yeah, pretty good. That's very impressive. Uh, you know, I always like to see people get together and form a community, whether it be, you know, in the game or out of the game. You know, I think that's really cool that you guys are able to do that and everything. Uh, because, you know, uh, you know, for some other online games, which me and my friends got together and played very often, we always get together every Sunday and have like a barbecue cookout, and then we get together for a tournament. You know, and, and, and this game in which I'm referring to was Sojo Fortune 2, and it was like all our, all our friends, you know, family friends and everything would just get together, you know, for a LAN party or something like that, you know, once a week. And we just have a great time. And, then, you know, to see you guys do that and everything, you know, that's that's what really, you know, forming a community and forming friendships, you know, with people in the game that you play with on a regular basis is all about. And, you know, that's 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 really awesome in my opinion. Go ahead, Manny. Yeah, you make a good point there. Um, I just wanted to uh, say before we got too far off the subject of the uh, real-life meetups is that, um, yeah, we've been doing it about once every year or once every other year. The uh, first one was in Salt Lake City, Utah at a, a member's um, cabin. The uh, second one was uh, for the wedding of the current GM uh, Zena in Las Vegas. And then this uh, third one, I think they uh, skipped a year, actually, and then, then we had this uh, other meetup in Tacoma, Washington. I just wanted to make that comment. Okay, and when was the first year that y'all did this, Manny? Um, it was before I was a member. Uh, Claude, do you remember when the Salt Lake City, Utah meetup was? Um, I'll probably be wrong, but I think it was in 2000. I, I, might, I can do some checking. I might have an answer for you in a few minutes. <laughs> like All right. It's really either once every year or once every other year, I think, uh, yeah. All right. Well, uh, in that case, I guess that gives, you know, concludes my questions and everything for now. So with that said, I'll turn it back over to Sakara. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, you brat. Um, one last question I had about those meetings. How long do they last? Anyone? 
Like, do they go on for like two days, three days a week? Um, go ahead, Tom. Uh, this one in Tacoma. Well, this is the only one I've been to. Um, it lasted, I say, roughly four or five days, but I personally stayed for about uh, almost two weeks. Holy cow! Okay, <laughs> that's actually great. Um, because I know I was kind of wondering the same thing when we had interviewed LLTS and they had told us about theirs. It also lasted about four days, and you know it is it can be quite a bit of money. You know, getting all these people together and renting hotel rooms and whatever. They had an even bigger group. I think they were like what over a hundred. I think that had uh, gone there. So it it can be uh it can be uh, quite a bit of logistic headaches getting all these people together but i think it's awesome now moving on to a different topic it's actually a question that i have for you um something i read on your website and it's regarding your raid points um is this something you guys still use today and if yes could you tell us a bit about it yes iron Claw. Okay, well, raid points are the points that we assign to people who attend our events and hunts that we have scheduled throughout the month, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, this encourages participation uh, greatly uh, because people are goal-minded in general, um, not just people in our guild, but in general. So what we do is we assign a particular point value, usually 10 points for every um, hunt that there is and 15 points for our meetings, and we also assign points for different things, like uh, we have a fighting tournament that they can earn extra points that way. With those points, they actually uh, accumulate different ranks and titles within the guild, uh, the lowest being squire. And once they accumulate a certain point total and have their time in the guild, then they go on to knight. And then the next is cavalier and so on. And it goes all the way up to crown prince. Currently, we do not have a crown prince yet. Um, I believe myself and Snake, we are the two highest uh, point earners in the guild right now, uh, both at Great Duke. So um, it's kind of a race between me and him to see who's going to get the next level. But um, also we have a time requirement within the guild. So once you reach a, a certain amount of time within the guild and you have a certain point total, then you can be promoted. What we do with the different ranks and titles is um, it's a prestige team, first of all. But we also use that to determine who's active in the guild and who's active in the game. And we look to those people when we're looking to fill leadership positions. Um, if there's an opening on the council, we don't want to fill it with somebody who only plays once a month. Uh, if there's a task that needs to be done, like a, a mall manager or an event planner or something like that, we don't want somebody who is only on once a week. We want somebody who's more hands-on. And so it helps us gauge the performance of individuals and helps the guild grow and since it was instituted this year um, I think January this year when we set up the site it's been a huge success um, there's medals that we give out for different titles and you know if you win an event and things like that so it's definitely a huge motivator and it's been a great success that's pretty cool so there is actual actually no um, uh, financial rewards for it. It's it's all about bragging rights, right? Um, bragging rights and responsibility. Uh, you know, there's no financial gain involved, like you said, but it's it's kind of more than bragging rights. It, it's kind of a, a reputation type of thing where, you know, you can go kill monsters and stuff and always be called a lord or lady in the game. But when you actually have a, uh, a guild-related tag next to that, it tells your other guild members that, you know, this person's been in the guild, they're a person of authority, that, you know, they're well-respected. And it, it helps identify who you are in the game and where we want to head as a guild. I think that's really awesome. And it's kind of funny because we, yesterday we had, um, in the talk show, we had been discussing the whole... Um, fame and karma um, in UO right now, and uh, and you know I think your system is actually what I had been saying I would like to see, where it's really more based on what you do and not the fact that you die to a monster should not make your fame and karma go away. 
it should be based on your your accomplishments and on you know uh, how much work you actually put into whatever it is that you're doing. So I think it's pretty cool. So you'll have to let us know which one uh, which one between the two of you makes it the prince first. But now for the next question, let's see which one I want to ask you for. Oh yeah, um, about the events you organize, um, you you were mentioning um, you know that you do peer life and all that stuff. But do you organize PVP events, and um, by this not only for your own guild but also with other guilds or tournaments or any other such things? Go ahead, Snake. We have uh, two types of uh, PvP events that we run. We have Fight Night, which is basically your average um, tournament type setting thing, you know, one-on-one -on -one matches until there's a champion that's declared. Then we have another uh, pretty fun event that's called Kill the Captain. It's basically like Capture the Flag with a more combat type setting. You have two teams. Each team has a captain. The uh, goal is to kill your opposing team's captain. Now, if any other normal member other than the captain dies, they can get resurrected by the uh, selected healers for the event and jump back in the event. As soon as the captain dies, the uh, the, uh, the other team wins and gets a point and then they go, we go pretty much for about two hours on that event and then we uh, gather the points and see who wins. As for uh, inner guild, inner guild uh, PP events with uh, other guilds, well, we haven't done so in quite a while. Okay, um, so the thing is I've been wondering would you, do you think there might have been more of those, um, I guess, in, in Trammel? Well, then again, you, you do, I believe in Trammel you can have the Guild Wars as well, right? It's no longer, I, I've never tried it, I've always done it in Fel, um, but I believe you can have Guild Wars where people go orange to you in Trammel, right? Go ahead, Snake. Yes, that is correct. That's how we uh, did the inner guild, uh, kill the captain with other guild. We'd um, temporarily ally with them, so we can, uh, well, we'd war with them just so we can get the event going. And then once the event was over, we'd uh, go back to peace. Okay, yeah, okay, I was just, I just wasn't sure anymore. I figured it, it worked in Tram too, but I, I haven't done it in Tram, so I was like, uh, does that work or not? Alrighty, well, that's pretty cool. Um, I always kind of wondered to what extent Trammel base skills really do have um, PvP going on, or if it's really more focused on um, on PVM. I know some of the RP guilds um, have some PvP happening because they do have certain um, wars, you know, when they're fighting over towns and whatnot. But um, I guess guilds that are less RP oriented. I I always wondered if there was any PvP happening there. Um, I think Vice Riff wants to say something. Go ahead, Vice. Well, actually, I have a question here, and it's about it's more has to do with the history and everything of uh, of uh, Guardians of Light and everything. And I noticed that your uh, guild was formed back in 1998, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so I'm kind of kind of wondering if you guys maybe might be able to fill us in on how you know the guild came about. And uh, whether or not you guys have a player-run town on Pacific, which you guys hang out at, or do you guys have a player-run town of your own, in which you guys have formed, you know, together, or, or, and what is your, you know, some of your uh, plans to, you know, take the guild in, uh, in the future, or something like that. I mean, I, I'm kind of curious as to, you know, um, you know, the overall history of, uh, you know, Guardians of Light. So, if anybody could answer that question, it, I, they would be great, you know, in helping uh, educate some of the listeners out there who are more curious about how the guild came about in the first place, you know, because there's always usually a reason why a guild is formed in the first place, and I'm kind of curious as to what that might have been. So, any of you guys have the answer to that, that question right there? Go ahead, Aaron Claw. Well, to be honest, uh, neither one of us were actually around when uh, GOL was actually formed. And I came on in game probably June, July of '99. So, according to our, you know, records that we kind of passed down between GM and other members, is that the guild itself, um, in its first form, was actually started in February of '99. So. Uh, um, that kind of makes me one of the oldest members still concurrently in the guild. 
so I'm an old-timer. But to be honest, I do not know how the guild was formed except for the uh, guild um, mythos that was passed down you know, from player to player. Um, so we just take it as, um, as their word is how it was formed. And the information that we have is that you know, it started out as a small guild. It was uh, called the Black Arrow. Uh, Manny mentioned this earlier. Um, they kind of split off a little bit. Some of the group wanted to do something else. Uh, when they didn't come back, uh, the people that were left were uh, Xena and a couple of the others, and they reformed, and that's the official start date of the Guardian's Flight. Um, since then, I mean, we've, we've grown with every expansion and covered new areas. Um, officially, you know, we really don't have a, uh, a goal, a master plan or anything like that. Our main goal of where we would like to take the guild is uh, to continue to grow, uh, to continue to have fun, uh, within reason. You know, we don't want to have, you know, a thousand members and have complete chaos. Uh, we like slow, steady growth with people that are good to have around and get along with the other people. Uh, fewer conflicts the better and we just you know, have to have fun and as long as uh, EA decides to keep pumping money into the game we plan on being here and having fun with it uh, as, as for a player run town we did have a uh, series of houses uh, northeast of Brit and that was where our old tavern used to be uh, there's still some guild members there with some houses uh, we came across a couple really good plots uh, east of Zinto in Takuna Islands that were just too good to pass up. So we uh, have two of our guild houses there, and that's our tavern and our mall. And there's a few members who have houses around there. There's no organized plan to have a guild town. Uh, it's never, never come to that. So, um, yeah, we, we just kind of play it loose and free, um, have fun. That's the priority, and to stay active, and that's the other thing. Uh, we just, it, it, the game itself, with the changes that happen, it can be rather limiting in the amount of entertainment you have. So it's the people that you surround yourself with that make the game more fun, and that's our main focus of the guild. I totally agree, because we was actually talking about that a little bit yesterday whenever we talked about people, you know, getting together during our talk show, you know, about people getting together and training up their characters and nowadays you see a lot of people training their characters either but doing eight by eight or bashing on a golem and I was like you know whatever happened to sparring and stuff like that you know that that used to be how it was done you know you sparred and while you were sparring with one another you were laughing about it or you were you know socializing with one another and getting to know each other a little bit more and, you know interacting with each other and now that's all faded away from the game for the most part and so you know yeah I definitely can uh, see that aspect of you know where you know it's really depending on the other person because if you're out there just playing the game and not really getting involved with anybody else or interacting the game's gonna be kinda dull and boring for you after a while um, so yeah I, I definitely can understand that uh, but I am kind of surprised that you uh, basically telling me that you're one of the oldest members and none of the original members are still around. Is, is, is that correct? And none of the original members are still around? And if so, uh, why is that the case? I mean, what was the reason for leaving the game in the first place? Did they just get tired of the game or didn't like the direction the game was going in? Or did they just not like Ages of Shadows or, or what? Uh, go ahead, Iron Claw. Well, that's a pretty interesting um We've had, well, I guess, I, first of all, I would have to define kind of our member base. Uh, it's not necessarily, and, and this is a generalization, it's not like a, a slam against anybody, but we don't have a lot of teeny boppers in our guild. Uh, we have generally uh, mid-20s and up. We have some that are younger, of course, and they're fine, nothing against them, but generally m most of our core members are 20 and up, myself included, I got no problem telling you how old I am. I'm 34, um, so I'm probably on the higher end of the age group. We have a lot of members with extended families who all play. You know, they got wives and kids, and you know, the whole nine. So uh, we also have a, a large group of people that are in the armed service. So it's kind of hard to play UO when you're being called to uh, do a more important duty. So, you know, we've had real-life issues that affect players. 
you know, there's countless reasons why a person would have to quit UO, at least for a while. And the, the beauty part of uh, GOL, I have to say, is this. We have players that were very active in the guild for you know, a good period of time, and then for whatever reason, you know, private matters, you know, things like that, they had to leave. But, you know, they might be sitting at home, they see their UO disc laying around, they decide to install it or go buy a new one or something like that. The one thing that they've been able to count on is the fact that GOL is still here. Uh, we've changed our location, you know, websites and stuff, uh, but you can always find that out. But, you know, we're kind of a standard, and they can count on that. They know that when they come back to UL, no matter, no matter what the changes have been, uh, you know, Blackthorns, Age of Six Shadows, ML, SE, that we're still here. So they know that the type of group that we are is still the same type of group that we were several years ago. You know, they got along with the people then, they'll get along with us. Uh, some of the things have changed a little bit, like, you know, we're more uh, event-oriented and we are more active than we used to be and we're, uh, you know, 10, 15 more times more organized than we used to be. So, you know, it's just a, a great experience. So what I was going to say before is we have people who have been gone for a long time that are coming back. Uh, we had at least three, I think just in the last 30 days that have been out of the game for over a year. So, you know, that's kind of what GOL is all about. All right, and I, I'm actually kind of curious, you know, because you you say that you've had people come and go. I'm curious as to whether or not you guys have ever had a founder lead the game, you know, that was one of the original members of GOL that founded the guild, and then them quit and then maybe come back. Have you ever had any of those uh, original founding members come back? And if so, if you have ever had them come back, what's y'all's uh, stance on that? Do y'all like step aside and let them come back and take over the reins? Or, or is it like, I, oh, I've been running this show now? Uh, I, I'm sure that would kind of ca cause a little bit of conflict or, of, uh, you know, or, or create some type of confusion, right? Uh, go ahead, Iron Claw. Um, we've actually had some... Um some members that have returned to GOL that were part of the founding group. Uh, it's unclear whether or not they were actually the founder or, you know, they were in pretty early. Um, you know, we afford them the respect that they're due, um, but they also have the understanding that in order to wear the guild tag, again, they do have to adhere to, you know, the way things are now. Uh, we do have a wonderful GM and Manny. Um, we, we have a great high council that backs him up, you know, toot my own horn, I'm part of that. And we have a council of elder, elders um, that back us up. So when, a, and it's kind of unspoken, we never have to put our foot down and say, you know, great, you're back, but you're, you're just who you are. And they know that when they come back, that we have an organization in place and it's working, and it's great, and they're just happy to be back. They, they never push it to, you know, I, I, demand to take over the guild or anything like that. It's never been a problem. I do not see that as being a problem ever. Um, we have a really good core group of people, and when they come back, they, they're just as fine as when they return. All right. And, uh, Mandy, did you want to add something to that, or did he pretty much touch on what probably all needed to be said in that? Go ahead, Mandy. Yeah, he pretty much covered it. Um, yeah, when they come back, it's a, a pretty welcome reunion. All right, and I guess I answered my question. Uh, Sakara, do you have any other questions in which you want to ask them, or uh, do uh, you want me to ask them a few more questions? No, um, actually, yeah, I do have a question, um, and it's actually um, <laughs> time warping back to uh, before um, the questions um, Vice Roy just asked you. Um, actually, I want to go back a little bit to, um, to PvP, and it was regarding the... Um, Actually, there's two two sides, two parts of this question. Um, you know, on one hand, how do you feel about the current state of PvP, and also, how do you think it's going to affect um, the 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 upcoming changes to PvP that are going to be affecting uh, PVM as well? How do you guys feel about that? Because, um, you know, people have been screaming. Uh, forever to have some PvP balancing done, 
And um, the dev team has pretty much said that all these changes are going to do are going to be affecting PVM. Now, I know you guys are mostly a PVM guild, even though you do some PVP. Um, how do you feel about all that? Go ahead, Snake. Well, currently the PVP is a tad bit unbalanced. I mean, I won't complain too much about it. I'll still go and do my thing. But uh, for the most part, it's kind of rough. You know, you got some templates that just work so much better than others. And with the new changes coming up, you know, it's, it's really hard to say. Um, we'll still, you know, go along with the PvP with how we've been doing it, and we'll just move along with the changes. As for how it'll affect PVM, uh, it may make it tougher, but we'll still just keep doing our thing. That's an interesting way of uh, looking at it, because um, I was kind of wondering, too, because you guys, uh, from my understanding, you do quite a bit of uh, the Pure Less bosses, and I was a little curious, how do you... How do you feel about them? Because, um, you know, some people are totally pulling their hair out, um, you know, about the whole pure list bosses because they're like, oh my god, this is like ridiculously hard. Whereas others are like, eh, you know, it's really not so bad once you, you know how it goes. Uh, how, and once you get the hang of it, it's, it's really a walk in the park. And then you have the other people that feel that, you know, it kind of sucks that it's, it's totally made for groups and I guess you guys have that you have quite a few people as uh, Manny mentioned you had like what 60 people that um, connected uh, to the game over the past two days so that means you do have uh, some fairly good turnouts um, but what if you didn't have such large numbers I'm sorry I'm asking a bunch of questions here in that one question but um, just I would like to have your thoughts uh, on the whole thing. Um, go ahead, Snake. Well, personally, I'm glad they added in a, a group of monsters and creatures that require a group to uh, take them out because that's what all Ultima Online is about. It's a community-based game. I mean, if you're going to be soloing, it's the game's going to get boring very quick and you're just going to have to quit out eventually. But um, as for being peerless as being difficult, it really depends on your organizational skills if you've uh, and your experience too if you uh done a peerless like your first time it's going to be rough regardless of whatever pbm experience you have each experience is new um but if you keep at it you know keep doing them regularly with you know uh, a decent sized group of like three or four people it can be done um with uh, practice and perseverance you can uh, pretty much get through anything i mean i've seen people blast through peerless and it only took three people. Um, our guild, we have um, took out Malasan with two people, uh, a tamer and a warrior. Um, and we've seen, we've ourselves, we had troubles on some peer lists where we needed like ten people. It's just, it's kind of hard to say. The more experience you have, the easier the uh, peer lists get. And to the community out there, I just have to say keep at it, you know, keep practicing at it. Eventually you'll find a good pattern and a good strategy against peer lists and you'll take them down quite quickly. I, I actually find it interesting that you mentioned um, some of you guys did it with two people and some other boss you did with three. Um, and, and I totally know that it's feasible because I've done it as well uh, myself uh, with just one other, other player taking out the travesty, uh, me on my tamer and him on his mage. Um, but do you think that it should be possible? Do you think that it's, it's normal that um, you know, more experienced players are actually able to do this? Or should it really be made a lot harder where you really need to have groups? And when I say groups, I mean more than six people and not as is currently the case where you can kill pretty much most of the bosses with only three or four people. Go ahead, Snake. It's kind of hard to say. I mean, the, the quality items that you get from Peerless, it's quite rewarding. So, in in my eyes, I say make it just a tad bit harder, but not overkill it. Because, you know, you got some people out there that just have a hard time with it. You know, there's nothing against their skill or anything. Um, and then there's just some people that have an easy time with it. But there should be a decent middle ground to where, you know, you need at least four or five people to take them out. That's, that's how I see it. Okay, my next question is moving a little bit away from that, but at the same time kind of still sticking to it. Um, and it's about the whole community thing. Um, 
I think a lot of um, players, I guess more the fell, the Falukans, um, feel that the game has lost a lot of its community aspect uh, when Trammel was introduced um, because things were so became so safe and, and skill gains became so easy that everyone and their brother could have pretty much every single template they needed. They could go about their business crafting safely and, and everything. And so, and you know, even um, hunting has become so much easier that nobody really needs anyone anymore, um, or hardly. And so, to what extent do you actually think, you know, there's any truth to it, if there, if at all? And do you really think that, um, in a way, keeping it fairly easy where everyone can do it with small numbers is really the way to go um, about rebuilding that community? Or, I guess, do you feel that there is a community still on Pacific or any other shark for that matter? Yes, Snake. Yes, uh, I do believe there's, uh, you know, community still based about the shard. They're not as large as they were, you know, for the whole Trammel Faluka thing. Um, they're more scattered about in smaller groups and such. Um, but with making PVM stronger and such, there needs to be a good middle ground because it, it's, it is nice being able to hunt alone, but it shouldn't be to the point where it's impossible. And it shouldn't be too easy to where if you have a group, it just gets boring. I guess that's probably the the hardest part. Um, I know that I'm looking at my own chart and even at myself. Uh, a lot of us vet players, you know, people, <laughs> the crazy people like me that have been playing the game for like eight years. Oh my God, you know, um, go like, okay, been there, done that, got the T-shirt. We've done pretty much everything that needs to be done. We can face most of the monsters um, solo and you know get away with it with hardly a scratch and uh and you're like huh there really is no more challenge but where you know you, at the same time you can't make the challenge so hard that the newer players don't find any entertainment in it either so i guess it's really hard finding um a middle ground where you can please pretty much everyone but uh, well, i guess we just need to uh to adapt to it. Um, let's see what other question I have for you. Oh yeah, um, I was just kind of wondering, what do you think would make the game even more interesting for you? I mean, every year um, EA brings us a new um, expansion. What would you? What do you think? Uh, what kind of an expansion would you like to see? Because there were really big debates about people wanting to um, for for the developers to focus more on graphics, others to uh, focus a lot more on bringing in more content, others you know asking that we we just go back in time and you know remove item properties and this and that. But you know, you guys seem to be to have a, a thriving guild and doing pretty good uh, right now. What do you think would help your guild grow even more, um, you know, as a guild, as players, and also, um, you know, as members of your community? Yes, Nate. Uh, my personal thought on that is uh, more monster diversity and such. I mean, the newest edition was great, you know, but... Most of these monsters that you uh, fight are quite difficult, which it, it should be, but it just seems to be lacking something. Um, there's, it just doesn't seem to be uh, as much flavor as you know previous contents that were added. You know, you got when T two A was added, everything everything was great because you got these extremely strange monsters that were added. In. Um, I guess what I'm saying is, um, add in some more creatures that bring in some more style and flavor fight uniquely and such. I hear you there. Manny, go ahead. Um, uh, an expansion more with the races, uh, bringing in orcs, uh, uh, possibly even gargoyles, uh, sticking with the UO uh, history, definitely, uh, but just more an expansion on playable races.
And that's one thing that people had, uh, you know, there had been quite the uproar um, of, you know, why were the elves brought in first and not, um, you know, the orcs or gargoyles. So I thought that was uh, also interesting. But yeah, it would be nice to uh, to see um, these other races also brought in. But um, before I actually let um, Aaron Claw make his comment, I do would like to ask you a question, Manny. Um, and I guess it also applies to uh, to everyone else. But it's you know regarding the um, the new the new uh, race. How do you feel about this whole thing about? items that are solely wearable by elves and not by humans. Um, do you think that was a good thing or that it was more an inconvenience? Well, uh, taking it back into the way it's always been with the female armor, um, I've always thought it was a bad thing just because we've, we've always had a lot of women in our guild. And they like to dress in the female armor. And as soon as you gave properties in AOS to armor, um, they, they were locked out of a lot of just the normal equipment that they'd see and still have an attractive looking suit kind of thing. Uh, before AOS, it wasn't as much of a problem, of course. Um, and I, I think doing that can continue, you know, the... Uh, segregation, if you will, of, of uh, the different races in UO. I think it would just be better if they would have a, a switch, maybe, uh, where you could make a particular piece of armor, either female or male, or um, in the case of the elven robes, uh, have exact duplicates that you might be able to trade to humans, say, and, and get the wearable one for your race, um, like they did with the Heart of the Lion and the Violet Courage as well. Yeah, because, uh, you know, the the reason I'm kind of wondering about this is because, you know, I think the elves, the elves have proven to work out very well um, in this expansion, and I really would not be surprised um, to see in the near future new races brought in, you know, such as the orcs or uh, the gargoyles. But, you know, what if we're going to start getting, you know, items that are solely wearable by orcs, or solely wearable by gargoyles and solely wearable by elves and solely wearable by humans. I mean, we already have so much junk, you know, where will it end? So that's kind of where I'm, I'm you know, kind of wondering where this is headed. But um, Iron Claw, go ahead. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to say stop UO racism now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm totally against that whole elf only thing you know you, you you work hard you try to get uh, you know a Marty and you get one and it's for elves only and that does me no good I have no health <laughs> um, the other thing that really burned me up was getting those recipes I was sitting down there in Hartwood and I was just doing mind numbing work over and over again trying to get these recipes and it was to make stuff eventually that was just for elves only and you know I, what's the point <laughs> uh, so I think they need to do something about that. Uh, it, it should be wearable by all. I mean, there should be things that are, look different on a particular character or something, or like Manny suggested, you can trade it in for, you know, your race version or something like that. But it, uh, I was really kind of put out with all the elf-only content. Uh, I Because me personally, I have characters that are a lot of crafters, you know, miners and lumberjacks and stuff like that. Uh, they can't afford to switch to elf because they would lose their um, carrying capacity and it just didn't appeal to me to try to convert everybody to be an elf. Um, so, you know, it worked out for people who wanted spell weaving and stuff like that, but it, I really felt that it was something that didn't really apply to me and I got kind of forced into it. But other ML content I was, I was impressed with, so that was kind of nice. Okay, and what about the future expansion? Oh my god, I'm sorry. Geez, I'm choking. Um, what about future expansion? What would you like to see in it, um, Iron Claw? Well, I'm not picky. Um, I was pretty impressed with the elves. Um, I was sitting back and I was listening to the UO Radio live broadcast of the announcement of what the new expansion was. And I have to say that the way they did it and rolled it out, I was pretty impressed. Um, 
you know, it, I had a feeling it was going to be the elves just because uh, I started noticing different things in the game, subtle things like uh, uh, Mondain's priest running around as red priest. There was more of them in certain areas, and I was like, wait a minute, that's kind of weird. And, and I, I don't know, I started reading up on UO history, and then it kind of started making sense. And I had a, a bet with a couple members in the guild that it was going to deal with the elves, and I happened to be right. Um, as for what race I'd like to see next, I'm not picky. Uh, I, I think orcs are kind of cute and underrated because, you know, you sit there and you go bash 20 of them with an orc slayer. They don't get much respect. So it'd be kind of funny to see something for orcs, but, you know, I'm open to anything. Already. Um, yes, Iron Claw, continue. Oh, sorry. oh, did you have something oh, sorry, else? Sorry, no. Okay, no problem. All righty, Vice, go ahead. Yeah, you know, I, I was kind of laughing to myself whenever uh, Iron Claw was talking about, you know, how uh, elves ought to be able to wear human armor and how humans ought to be able to wear uh, elf stuff. And I can just imagine them introducing a, a gargoyle and, and, and a gargoyle being as big as he is trying to put on a human t-shirt or something like that. <laughs> you know, or, or trying to fit into a, a pair of human pants or something. But, uh, yeah. Anyways, I just wanted to make that little comment. You're such a new vice, but uh, now that you mention it, um, it would be interesting to see a fiery gargoyle wearing a, a human um, tunic or whatever. See how long that would last. But yeah, um, I don't know. I just think that little things like that are more of an annoyance, really, than um, profitable in any way or form. I just don't see why, um, you know, an elf could not wear what a human's wearing or vice versa. It's not like the elves are overly different, um, physically speaking, than humans are. I could understand with races that are a lot different, let's say they were to introduce gnomes or, you know, even gargoyles that are so much bigger. So, yeah, I could see a problem there, but between elves and humans, not really. Go ahead, Iron Claw. Yeah, I was just going to say, if uh, history shows us anything, uh, EA's solution to the problem with the uh, different armor for, say, gargoyles, our paper doll would probably still look human, just with some wings added to it, and maybe a different uh, graphic for the face. So it would look pretty much the same for us anyway. Probably, unless they uh, they do that uh, huge uh, graphic overall that people have been asking for for quite some time. Um, Snake, you wanted to say something, go ahead. Uh, I think probably the only way to be able to get away with that would be saying, oh, the new race, half human, half gargoyle, or half race, or something like that. Yeah, that actually might work. Now, um, my next question for you guys. How do you feel about um, the current EM events? Do you have any happening? I don't think there's any happening anywhere at the moment, but you know, how do you feel about how the current you? EM events? And um, I guess, I don't know for how many of you were there long enough um, to have known the Sierras and whatnot, but, but um, if we were to talk about EM events versus Sierra events versus, um, you know, what we had between EMs and uh, Sierras, which were scenarios, what would you like to see? Um, more of and or you know how do you feel about the whole um, quest scenarios and whatnot that we have right now go ahead Snake. Uh, the quest things are quite interesting uh, but they, they tend to be more solo based it'd be interesting if you can get uh, some quest material that are more group based but as for the um, special events that are held shard wide I guess my only complaint is since it is shard wide it tends to be a little bit too cluttered and laggy um, you know, you got people with 56k that cannot uh, participate because it's just, it's unbearable. But um, it'd be more interesting if they had, you know, Sears back in the game that would wander around and offer up some minor, you know, interesting quests and stuff like that that wasn't, you know, notified by the whole shard. That way you can have like a small group of people or, you know, a fairly decent size but not ridiculously huge that would be able to complete it. Yeah, I know what you mean. I think that's probably the recurring problem that um, we've heard about, and which is why 
most of the EM events are not um, widely advertised. It's because when they do and because they drop some uber items, collectible items that end up being worth a ridiculous amount of gold, um, they can't really advertise them. And it's frustrating to the people that miss out on them. But at the same time, if you do advertise, you get a gazillion people there and it's like, here comes Lagfest. So, yeah, how do we get a balance there? Go ahead, Iron Claw. Uh, I was just going to say, I do like uh, some of the changes they've made with the EM events, like the gem system, they made a tweak to that, and it's, it makes a lot more sense. I personally have not been able to get to an EM event because of um, my location and hours, and, and the fact that they're not announced really didn't work well with my schedule, so I miss out on a lot of those. But scenarios, um, one of the scenarios I liked, but they kind of overdid it, was the Invasion of Brit. Uh, when they were building the barricades, that was kind of nice uh, because it, I saw people from guilds that I have never spoke to ever in years, you know, at all. And we were, you know, dumping the ingots and the logs trying to build these barricades just because we wanted to try to, you know, stop the invasion. The only problem was, and I see in like uh, the invasion of Cove, is that the scenario goes on for way too long. I think, what was the other one? Um, the Dragons and Trenzic? That went on way too long. Um, if it's going to be a scenario, it should probably have a set start and stop time. Uh, I don't know if uh, whoever was in charge of shutting it off just forgot or something, but it went on for way too long. If, if they mixed it up, then it would probably be better. And that's pretty much all I got to say about that. It's just too long. <laughs> I agree. Uh, I think the one thing that totally drove me insane about um, the invasions, not necessarily the scenarios that we have, but really the ones when you have invasions, the invasions could last for almost three months. That's when it becomes retarded. Um, I think, you know, a couple of weeks is fine, even to a certain extent one month, even though I think it's pushing it at one month, but when the same thing goes on for three months, you're like, my God, you know, um, you can't recall into that town. People that live next to it just get their butts kicked, you know, 24-7. It's like going home is a nightmare. Um, and it's always the same towns, um, usually the crafter towns like Cove and Minoc. So, you know, after a while, you're like, oh, I can't do this like again already. So, yeah, I... I totally feel your pain on this one because it drove me nuts. Go ahead, Snake. But I see what was wrong with that situation is there was no way you actually won with it. You just had to wait until they actually shut it off. But it, I, I think the best way they could have handled that situation was to where you can actually have the shard win against the evasion, like fight them back to the point where none of them existed or they retreated. But instead, you know, you just had to wait for the whole thing to be shut off. Yeah, I think, um, you know, probably they would have had better success with it in a way if they set a number of kills to win the scenario. So that it's not just, okay, no matter how many of them you kill, they're still going to be there spawning some more and pestering you forever and ever and ever. So people actually end up getting fed up and give up. Um, I think they had gotten a bit closer to that with the... Um, you know, the Despise Invasion, where you had all these creatures that were actually coming towards Britain. Um, you know, all these uh, generals and whatnot that were coming to Britain. Um, you could actually beat back the invasion for a while, and once you had defeated them, yeah, once you have defeated the wave, they would actually not show up for, um, you know, a number of hours uh, before the, um, the, in the invasion resumed. So, I, I have to agree, I think... That was probably the best way um, they could have gone about it. Um, now, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah. I think it's time for uh, Viceroy's infamous question. So go ahead, Viceroy. Yep, I always ask every guild in which we ever have on EO Radio as to whether or not 
uh, they would be interested in ever playing on a pre-Renaissance shirt, uh, server or anything. Should they ever come out and introduce one? As you probably know, if you by any chance got the survey about a week or two ago, you probably read it that it's somewhere in there that they was hitting at maybe granting access to a pre-Renaissance uh, server or something like that if you were to pay 30 bucks or something like that. Now, my question is, is what you would any three of you guys be interested in something like that and i guess i'll go down the list here you know basically ask you guys if that's something you guys would think would bring about more community interaction between players or or what i mean um and i'm not sure if you guys even played uh, uh, prior to pre-renaissance so that's going to be a quite interesting question i guess to ask you guys but go ahead uh iron claw uh, do you what's your feelings about pre uor uh well kind of mixed uh, i know aos did a lot of damage to the way things are played now but to be honest i don't want to go back just because it, I don't know. It's too far back now. We've been spoiled with some of the good content that came out of the uh, changes since, and I just couldn't go back. All right, and just for the records, did you ever play when there was just Faluka only, or did you come after that? Yes, I was there when there was only Faluka only. Um, one of our original guild houses was west of Brit along the mountain pass, and... I think it's still there. It was in one of the restricted areas where it was placed on a uh, farm field. So it, when they did the uh, house placement, you know, you cannot place here and things like that, it was always tagged with that. But as long as it, the account stays active, that house is going to stay there forever, I hope. Sweet. I hope you guys don't ever lose that house because uh, those houses are, like, ultra rare and, and very hard to come by. So... Yeah, I uh, hope you guys do uh, keep that house and everything. So, um, that I'm going to move along and ask Manny what you think about pre-UOR and what are, you, what are your experiences with it? Have you ever played uh, prior to uh, Trammel or or did you come in after Trammel? Go ahead, Manny. Um, I came in with Trammel, uh, bought UOR in the uh, store and... Uh, Read a lot on the forums about, you know, the changes and whatnot. I did see a lot of complaints about stuff before UOR. So, I mean, I'd be interested in checking a UOR shard out um, server, that is. Um, but I'd like little little nice things like uh, guild chat and uh, actual alliance and um, the ability to establish emissaries and, and Ronin. Um, yeah, there's a lot of nice things that have came about since AOS that I would miss if it was just a straight UOR uh, publish. Yeah, very good point. And so, so um, well, I guess that, you know, okay, well, I'll ask that question here after I ask Solid. Uh, so, Solid, what are your thoughts on a pre-UOR chart? Uh, would you be interested in something like that or what? Go um, ahead. Yeah, I actually played during the pre-UOR as well. Um, I was always running around uh, being pestered by the local PKs and such. And, you know, it was sort of fun in its own sense, you know. It, you know, brought about a sense of adventure every time you wandered out of town. You know, you always had to worry, you know, like, oh, is this guy going to jump me or, you know, am I going to get smacked down by a monster and then you know, lose all my stuff. But um, would I go back? It's kind of hard to say. Um, basically, the only way I would go back is if, Pretty much all GOL went back. I go where our guild goes. Okay, so um, that's going to actually lead to my second part of the question, which I was going to ask Manny, but I decided I'll uh, wait until I asked you the question. Uh, so, you know, basically, are you guys not into realism, or you guys are into realism, or what? I mean, are you more into the final fa uh, f uh, fantasy aspect of the game, or what? What would you say is is what really does it for you? Is it the quests that really that keeps you in the game or is it the people in the game and I mean if it's the people would that still be like the case you know if it was just Faluka uh, because I mean I'm, I'm try I guess I'm trying to get a better gauge of where you guys stand or you know what really draws you into the game other than the people uh, so I'm going to go down the list here again and starting with Iron Claw what really keeps you in the game other than the people in your guild and the players of Ultima Online Bod. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, 
No, I have to say oh. that only because I will not stop until I get one Valorite hammer. And I'm not going to buy one, and I'm not going to pay money on eBay. I'm going to earn one, darn it. All right. <laughs> wow. Uh, I didn't think I would hear that word, especially with the way he is right now. So I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised that you said bods. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to go down to Manny now. And what, what, what really does it for you other than the players uh, themselves, uh, Manny? Yeah, I definitely love the players and love the, love the game itself, uh, the PVM and PVP both. Um, but if I had to nail it down to one thing that really did it for me, it would be the housing. Um, the custom housing, being able to design, and, and uh, even some of the classic plots. I just really love the, uh, that ability to feel like you have ownership of something in, in UO. All right, and Solid Snake. Um, what personally did it for me was, uh, I don't know, um, I'm more of like a, a combat-based person. Um, I, I, when I uh, go out to PBM, it's not about fighting the strongest thing anymore. It's more about charging in, taking out huge masses of creatures, like uh, just north of Oasis and Jamal nowadays is flooded by Ophidians. Sure, they don't offer, you know, a rewarding, you know, with gold and such, but if you charge ahead and just have fun in the combat, uh, that's basically my sort of thing. You know, run in, get swarmed by tons of creatures, and then just take them all out or, you know, die trying. Yeah. See, you know, and I was actually trying to explain something to uh, the people on the forums a little while back on the U-Haul forums, because a lot of people are like, well, you know, we got all these different aspects of the game that you could be enjoying. I'm like, you know, I'm sorry, I was never really into PVMing, uh, you know, just whacking at monsters. I was never really into any other aspects. The only three aspects of the game that I really enjoyed was crafting, uh, you know, going out and buying and trading, and then, you know, player versus player. And those were the three aspects. And I said, well, player versus player has been ruined for me ever since I came out with Ages of Shadow because now I have to be out there buying with 60 or 70 million gold worth of gear just to be able to uh, PVB. And I, I said, so that's ruined for me. And I said, there's no easy way to get all that. And then I said, you know, crafting, it's been pretty much... Uh, you know, ruined because uh, nobody's even around the crafting forge anymore. Nobody needs weapons, or there's no breakage of weapons, or or anything of that nature. So I said that's two aspects of the game that's been totally ruined for me. And I said the only little aspect left of the game for me is now just buying and trading, you know, and, and reselling stuff. And that's that's been restricted because you know the the um, regency or the the regents, the uh, regent vendors, whenever there was a reg reagent or whatever you want to call it, um, whenever that was around, you used to be able to buy those and resell them in bulk for like 400k or something like that, and now I can even do that, so I mean, it's a lot of my aspects, the, my, a lot of my favorite aspects of the game have been really nerfed for the most part, and you know, you have to think about all the other aspects of the game that I did not mention that other players have a gripe about, you know, such as thieves. They've been nerfed into oblivion, so what other aspects of the game have been completely nerfed and stuff like that? You know, th that's why I'm more of a, you know, pre or guy, because, you know, a lot of those aspects were not nerfed, and, you know, it was a lot more simplistic, you know, prior to AOS, because you could just grab a, you know, a, a dagger, or you could grab a Chris or a sword and a few bandages and run out there naked and, you know, jump right back into action, you know. It was none of that hard stuff, you know, where you have to go get 60 or 70 million gold worth of gear. Um, and then on top of that, you know, I just like the, uh, you know, good versus bad guys uh, type aspect to the game. Uh, you know, you, didn't, you don't have that anymore, really. And I guess that's something I really miss because, really, the only bad guys in the game nowadays is the monsters, and I'm sorry, the monsters are not smart enough to outwit me, you know, in a lot of ways. It's just artificial intelligence, and, and you know, after five or six or seven or eight years, I've been in this game for eight years, and after eight years of that, you just get enough of it. You know, like, I want something that's real, that's got a brain, somebody that can actually formulate a strategy, and maybe outwit me, give me a run for my money, and uh, I don't have that. Um... But anyways, enough of my writing. That's my feelings about the game. But, Sakara, do you have any other questions for them? Yep. Actually, I got two more questions for them. Um, the first one is actually, you know, we talked about EFL that went out on um, a grand tour. 
But what about GOL? Will you guys ever actually consider exharding your guild? Um, is this something you guys would ever contemplate doing? And uh, if so, you know, where would you actually go? I guess I stumped you with that one, didn't I? <laughs> yes, Iron Claw. Uh, well, speaking for myself, I'd say no. <laughs> uh, well, it. Well, I I want to be as politically correct as I can on this. I believe FL had something to prove, not to other people, but something to themselves, or they were really unhappy where they were, and they decided to do their world tour. Um, you know, one of the things I pointed out about GOL is that we have been here for a very long time. We are like a rock. We are not going anywhere. And we have nothing to prove to ourselves or anyone else by cross-sharding. It's pointless to us. Uh, it may work for other people. Uh, it's expensive. It's just something that we wouldn't want to try to you know, incur a cost on to our members just because um, we think we have to prove something. So we know who we are, and people in Pacific know who we are. And we have a good reputation. We like to keep it that way. And we just don't have anything to prove to anybody. I guess that's a way of looking at it. But, you know, there are, I mean, I was comparing to FL because I know it's it's a guild that you guys can relate to. But there are other guilds that actually moved um, just to get a fresh start or to bring a new challenge. Um, I know personally when uh, Lake Austin opened, I, I actually went to Lake Austin and started there from scratch, you know, right in the early days. And it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't actually to, to prove anything to myself. It was, it was really more in a way to live back the old days because it was so different, you know, when you start with nothing, when, when everybody needs everybody because, you know, we're all a bunch of noobs and we can't be training everything at the same time. And so... You know, it's like um, scribes actually were very important. When you could find one that could make you that recall scroll, <laughs> I mean, that guy was suddenly God to you because you couldn't do it. And, you know, a smith with only 70 was selling armor like mad because um, nobody could craft anything. Um, and he was probably the best thing you had. So if you could craft one that was even just exceptional... Um, that was the bomb compared to what you would get off NPC. So I guess it's more in that sense because obviously you guys are not a raiding guild. You're not going out to war. But I guess that's the question I was kind of wondering if it is something you might contemplate to just experiment the game differently. Go ahead, Iron Claw. Uh, I have to admit that's something I did as well. Uh, I still have a couple characters on Lake Austin. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I guess I kind of answered before as a guild. As a guild, we probably wouldn't do something like that. Uh, as individuals, um, like you pointed out, you need a fresh start, something new, and it is fun. Uh, that's something that each individual would have to make as a decision. Uh, it's something to add a little spice to the game, make things less tedium. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I completely know what you're talking about. I went there, and I was uh, a... Um, cartographer because that was a kind of a quick way to raise some skill and raise a little gold so I can actually do something there because I had nothing <laughs> you know I had a thousand in the bank and I, it was a big deal when I got a horse <laughs> so uh, yeah individually I know a lot of our members have characters on other shards and they play because you do need to change it up but as a as a guild related thing I don't think we would ever you know move around and shard hop yeah, I understand you that there. Um, it is difficult to get, especially a larger guild, to to move or to actually convince people to start a newbie character um, and start with nothing when you've been, you know, you're well established somewhere else. Go ahead, Snake. Yeah, Fire Club pretty much covered the majority of what I was going to say. It's just, to me, it's a bit too costly to be cross sharding and such. And we'd probably lose a lot of members because they probably wouldn't be too interested and moving on over. But yeah, I too remember the whole Lake Austin thing. It was 
funny seeing, uh, you know, like five or six people try and raid the Ratman area just west of Spirituality and El Center, and then you see five ghosts running to the shrine. Yep. <laughs> I think that was the beauty of uh, of uh, that shard, but unfortunately, I didn't find that same feeling when uh, Origin was when Origin opened. Um, I actually tried it for the same reason, but I don't know. To me, there wasn't the same magic on Origin as there had been on Lake Austin. But go figure. Yes, Nick. Uh, the only problem I had with that was um, when you have people starting off with nothing, but then you have people started off with. Uh, all the uh, the leggings and members and the samurai helmet and stuff that they bought, you know, online and such. And I didn't find that too fun at all. True. I don't know. It was just it was just really different. But oh well. Um, and I guess this brings me to my last question for you guys. And uh, it's really, what's in the future for you? Where would you like to see your guild in one year and five years and in ten years if? Uh, U.S. still has uh, 10 years uh, ahead of it. Um, you know, do you have any grand plans for the future, or uh, are you just hoping for more of uh, a bit of the same of what you currently have already going on? Yes, Nick. Uh, personally, I can see us, you know, pretty much keeping the same basic concept, but, you know, adding some more diverse events and such to the guild and such, probably doing more with the community and such, and, you know, let the community know us a little bit more. Um, you know, but the basic concept will probably remain the same in the road ahead. Alrighty. Well, um, Iron Cloth, go ahead. Well, uh, being number one wouldn't be that bad either. You know, number one overall. You know, <laughs> we wouldn't shy away from that if it happened. Um, but it's certainly not one of our goals, but it would be kind of nice. But like Snake said, um, we're doing good the way we are now. Uh, I would like to see as well um, involving more of the Pacific community involved in our events. It is a little bit harder and it requires a lot more work because we always uh, strive to put on a good show, if you will, when we're doing events that deal with the public. Uh, with the guild, you know, we're organized, we know what we're doing, and uh, you know they're set, and we're, we had a lot of practice with this. Uh, We've had a couple events in the past where we decided not to do them because they weren't going to be done exactly right uh, because of some complications or some glitches in the game itself. So we strive to put on uh, as flawless an event as possible, and I would like to see us being able to do that um, aside from the regular um, repair night and things like that we might throw. Uh, you know, something more regular and a lot more exposure. Make the game more fun. And uh, some of the topics we covered earlier in the interview, like role-playing, things like that, I would like to see uh, us take on a more role-playing aspect in the game, uh, you know, in event-wise, not day-to-day, -day, but at least in event-wise. So, uh, you know, you can come meet the quiz master or something like that and send him on a quest or something like that. You know, just goofy things that involve more people. Uh, the one thing that fascinates me about the game is that as long as it's been going, it's still getting new players. Uh, of course, you know, we might lose a few players here and there. Uh, I don't know if it's an overall gain or a loss, but I know we still get people that are brand new to the game. And being able to meet people like that and open up a whole new world for them is kind of thrilling and it's kind of nice. And uh, I'd just like to see us be that rock, be that steady thing that everybody knows that they can count on when they come to Pacific. I I can uh, understand where you're coming from there. And, uh, yeah, I totally know what you mean about, you know, having more events with more RP involved. I think that's probably what we're missing the most. Manny, did you want to say something? Just that Claude had a good answer. <laughs> Okay. Um, actually, um, before I do wrap up, I just suddenly remember there was another question I wanted to ask you. And this is um, something uh, I think it was Manny that had mentioned earlier, um, that you guys really try to um, live um, your, your game life. Um, according to the virtues and whatnot, um, that you know people have to follow the virtues and everything. And I was kind of wondering, um, do you actually push that to um, people actually 
getting the virtues as well? Um, do you expect your members to get compassion and uh, sacrifice and, uh, and all the, the virtues that are currently active in the game? Yes, Nate. Uh, we don't really require members to have the actual in-game virtues and such. It is nice, you know, for them to have it. But what we, what we really want is basically a polite, respectful person that is around to, you know, promote a good environment for the rest of the guild. That's what we look for in a virtuous person. Oh, okay. Um, and yeah, <laughs> I can understand you there too, because the bigger the guild, um, the crazier it can get if people are basically being... Um, downright rude and, and unpleasant to each other so yeah I was just kind of curious because um, I know that I personally kind of pester my guildies about getting some of the virtues especially compassion um, and sacrifice seeing as we are a foul guild but you know for a hunting guild too um, compassion comes so unbelievably handy when you have to raise someone in the middle of a bunch of uh, spawn that's ganking left and right Go ahead, Iron Claw. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that when the virtues first came out, we tried to incorporate them into our guild structure. Um, you know, incorporating what type of virtue that you were going to follow within the guild. Uh, so we would have uh, compassion knights and honesty knights and things like that. Um, I think we were off to a good start, but the problem came from the game itself, I guess, uh, because uh, they only released two of the virtues I think at first and you know some people were like well I don't want to be this one I want to wait for the other one that never came so they kind of hamstringed us and so we didn't get to evolve that and then it got a little more complicated where uh, you know if you're looking at rank who is who's more important a compassion knight or uh, a justice knight or something like that you know it, it just got too divided and we just scrapped the whole project and went with a more consolidated guild structure. Um, like Snake pointed out, we look for people who actually exemplify the virtues, not necessarily um, have them in the game, but we look at the, uh, you know, past the pixels and actually at the person, because one of the questions that we do like to ask, uh, you know, which one of the virtues in the game, or from the game, reflect you as a person in real life? And you hear a lot of different answers, and, you know, a lot of them just kind of pop off an answer, you know, honesty. Well, that's good, but why? And it, judging from those answers is how we get, actually try to get inside the head a little, if you will, uh, to the player who's actually at the keyboard. Because, uh, you know, you can be well-versed in the game and just be a total whack job. <laughs> you know, we, we, we try to steer away from that. So um, we, we actually look for people who are honorable and believe in a good sense of justice and you know believe in fair dealings with other players in the game so it's it's more like a, a character call uh, of the person not the character so much in the game all righty thanks much and uh, i believe this wraps it up for me um i would like one of you to uh to please remind our listeners what your uh, website address is if, you know, they want to find out more about you guys and uh, maybe if they want to apply as well. So um, who would like to uh, give the uh, URL again? Ironclaw, go ahead. Yes, the website for GOL on Pacific is gol.guildportal.com. Um, Please do not add a www in there, or it will take you someplace else, and it's not us. So it's just gol.guildportal.com, and from the top of the page, you can um, you have to create a guild portal ID, and then you can select join GOL, and it will take you through the application process. Once you fill out all the questions, the application is sent to the high yep. council, and we review it, and we proceed with the application from there, and hope to hear from you. Alrighty. So this was the interview with uh, the Guardians of Light of Pacific. Um, I don't know if uh, you guys want to say uh, a little goodbye. So uh, I'm going to let uh, Iron Claw start. Sure. I just wanted to say it's uh, been a pleasure. Um, we were a little bit nervous here, and I, I think it went very well. I just want to say uh, hi to and goodbye to everybody in Pacific. And I don't know. I had fun and hope to do it again sometime. 
Thank you. Manny, if you want to say something. Hi, all. Manny here. I uh, just wanted to say thank you very much for having us. It's been a real pleasure. And Solid Snake, if you want to say goodbye. Uh, yes, thank you for having us. It was a real pleasure and an honor. And uh, to the Pacific community, keep having fun out there. We hope to see you out there as well. Alrighty, so thank you very much for being with us, guys. Was, uh, we had a great time with you. And thanks to everyone that joined us uh, in IRC and uh, the people that are listening to us right now. So it was the interview with the Guardians of Light, um, GOL Guild of Pacific. And uh, this is DJ Sakara signing off with um, Viceroy, who was there to pester us as usual. And uh, stay tuned. Um, as usual, we are going to have some great music coming up later. And um, we will have more community interviews for you um, next weekend and our usual talk shows on Saturdays, always from 5 p.m. Eastern to 7 p.m. Eastern time. So um, thanks again, and we will be uh, with you again soon. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone.